pretty pretty stories. of Doxy, Fozzie, and Friends. My name is Shannon, and I am delighted to be joined by Doxy and Fozzie Bear. Fozzie. And we are very excited today because uh, we get to introduce you to some of our other furry family members today. Fozzie Bear, are you excited? <coughs> Good job. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. So our first book today is called Vicky One Way by Ella Frisby. Now that name might sound familiar because of course that was our young author uh, who wrote Ollie and Zoe, which is about the therapy dogs that these guys were friends with, but you know, have since passed on that age. What good dogs they were. But uh, Ella, uh, one of their young readers at the library, also wrote this book in addition to her first book, which was Ollie and Zoe. So we'll hear from her again in Vicki One Way. Dedication for Paula Ollie's owner. Thank you for helping me publish my first books and being my special friend over the years. Vicki One Way. Hi, my name is Victoria One Way but you can call me Vicky. I have straight blonde hair, blue eyes, and two BFFs. I have a dog named Haley. I am a tomboy, or tom-tom as I like to say. This is my family. And it says Victoria, a girl who follows her dreams. Dad, dad of three kids. Vince, Vicky's five-year-old brother, who is a little pest. Veronica, Vicky's eight-year-old sister. Mom, mom of three children. Lily, a nerd soon to be popular. And Flora, a girl who just wants to fit in. I sometimes think I don't even belong in this world because I wear glasses and dress different than other people. I am 10 and I am in the third grade. My teacher is Mrs. Andrew and I had to do first grade twice because I could barely read. I still don't read very well. I'm always afraid to read in front of the class. I struggle in school. I'm going to the library again. I've been going to the library for three years. I'm only going because of the dog, Ollie, who is a reading tutor. Here's our friend, Ollie. I enter the library and everybody stares at me. I wonder why they are staring at me, I say to myself. Then I see people whispering and pointing to my shoe. I look down and... I see there's toilet paper hanging out of my shoe. I'm having the worst day ever. Poor Vicky. I've been watching the kids read to the dog for three years. I walk over to the dog and feel a strange feeling. I realize that it's courage. I go ahead and sign in to read to the dog. I pick out a book and open it to start reading. I find out that it's not courage. It's the soda I drank earlier. The kids see me frozen in my spot and tell Ollie's owner. That 
that's not good, huh? She tells me I can do it, and so do all the kids in the library, even the kids whispering about my shoe. I try reading and actually read well. And all the kids say, you can do it. Now I have the courage to do anything. I'm doing better in school and went from third grade to fifth grade. I love to read. I get 10 books from the library every week when I read to Ollie. And that's it for now. Signed, Vicki One Way. And this is about the author. Ella is nine years old and is in fourth grade. She has been reading since she was four years old and reading is one of her favorite hobbies. She reads to not just Ollie, but the dogs at two libraries, including Zoe. She goes to the library at least once every week and reads up to 15 books per week. This is her second published book. Her little sister, Cora, is learning to read too, and they both enjoy reading to their dog, Haley, at home. All right, the end. That was good, huh? Yeah, we like reading about our friends. And that's the kind of thing that you guys do. And we miss our friends at the library too. Yeah, we do. So for our next segment, we're going to bring in a very special guest. And that is Doxy's mom, Rita. So Doxy's mom has been with us, of course, as long as Doxy has been. Huh, your mommy's a good girl. And she was originally found by the side of the road, poor baby girl. So she's doing much better, um, been with us for a very long time and also lived with my mother-in-law for a while too. But um, she's nearing kind of the end of life right now. So it's nice to get to read to her and introduce her to you guys. Uh, give her a nice day with her son and her friend here. So I'll be right back and I'll get our friend Rita. So I'd like to present to you beautiful Rita here. Rita is Doxy's mom. I don't know if you can see all the uh, family resemblance. There's not a whole lot there. All the puppies were very, very fluffy. And so we think that Doxy's daddy, we don't know who it was, must have been very handsome. Not that Rita isn't beautiful. But she just has very short fur, as you can see. So for the first time, making her debut on Doxy, Fozzie, and Friends. And we're going to read to her Martha Speaks by Susan Meadow. So this one's a funny book about what happens if a dog eats a talk. Huh. I'm sure they have a lot to say, and we'll find out what Martha has to say right now. Martha Speaks, Susan Meadow. For the Finneys. says, I hope that soup is gone when I come back in there. The day Helen gave Martha Dog her alphabet soup. Something unusual happened. This is Martha's brain. The letters in the soup went up to Martha's brain instead of down to her stomach. That evening, Martha spoke. She says, isn't it time for my dinner? Martha's family had many questions to ask her. Of course, she had a lot to tell them. Have you always understood what we are saying? You bet. You want to know what Benji is really saying? Why don't you come when we call? You people are so bossy. Come, sit, stay. You never say please. See dogs dream? Day and night. This morning I dreamed I was chasing a giant meatloaf. Why do you drink out of the toilet? Lassie is not all that smart. What's all this nonsense about pit bulls? SPCA, talk about changes in my diet? Mr. Ed, woof. 
the lack of Zoe. Alphabet soup became a regular part of Martha's diet, and the family had a wonderful time surprising people. Walking the dog was always good for a laugh. Yo, Rinty! Good dog, how's the flea problem? They ordered pizza from a different restaurant every night. Martha says, how much do I owe you? They taught Martha how to use the phone, but this was a mistake. She says, hello, Acme Meat Company? I'd like to make an order. Pretty soon, more than pizza was being delivered. She says, but I didn't order any barbecue. Family and friends were amazed. Martha says, please pass the carcass. And she says, wanna go for a walk, Granny? Although there were those who doubted, Martha always had the last word. There's no such thing as a talking dog. Speak, Martha. Martha, speak. <coughs> Just kidding. But there was a problem. Now that Martha could talk, there was no stopping her. She said exactly what was on her mind. Why is that man so fat? Uh-oh. I don't know if you want to mess with that guy. She made embarrassing comments. Mom said that fruitcake you sent wasn't fit for a dog, but I thought it was delicious. And she always told the truth. Who did it? Helen did it. Occasionally she wondered why her family was often mad at her. Oh, poor Martha. But she kept on talking. She talked through everyone's favorite TV shows, except her own. I've seen this program. Want me to tell you what happened? The giant reptile did it, and the little kitten gets blamed, but it's okay because Ninja Woman and Enviro Man team up to save the little kitten and, of course, the world, and, and then her says, Pitbull Pup Petrifies Paris. She talked while they were trying to read. There's a poodle over on Circuit Street I'd really like to play with. He's small, but what a dog. And speaking of small, I'm sure you're all curious about the early days of my life. She talked and talked and talked until her family could not stand it and said, Martha, please. And she says, I was born in a back alley to a poor but loving mother. Although she was a mixed breed and mama was determined to raise us puppies right to give us a solid background before we went out into the world at eight weeks, even before our eyes that were open, mama would say, your dogs, not cats. Don't ever forget that. Blah, 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 blah. I still remember the rules Mama gave us to live by. Number one, beware of two-year-old humans with closed bins. Number two, under the table is the very best place to be during a meal. Number three, never mistake your human's leg for a tree. That was from my brother's report. And if it's black and white and smells funny, number four, it's not a cat. Don't chase it. And while we're on the subject, I understand cat, but I can't speak it. Blah, blah, blah. Wait, where was I? Oh yes, blah, blah, blah. Did you know that my mother gave me a name before you did? She named all of us puppies. I was three. My sisters were one, six, and seven. My brothers were two, four, five, and eight. I never did like eight very much, but six was a lot of fun. Blah, 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 blah. I'll never forget my father's face when he saw all us puppies. Boy, that's a lot of puppies, he said. What a funny dog. Yeah, the last day. Shut up. What's wrong? asked Martha. You talk too much, yelled father. You never stop, yelled mother. Sometimes, said Helen, I wish you had never learned to talk. Martha was crushed. Oh no, poor Martha.
She's a good dog. The next day, Martha did not speak. She didn't ask for her dinner or to go out. She offered no opinions, but lay quietly beneath the kitchen table. At first, her family enjoyed the silence, but after a while, they became worried. What's the matter, Martha asked Helen. Martha didn't answer. Helen's father called the vet. There's something wrong with my dog, he said. She won't say a word. Is this some kind of joke, snapped the vet. Helen offered Martha bowl after bowl of alphabet soup, but Martha had lost her appetite for letters. Martha's family wondered if she would ever speak again. Then one evening when her family was out, Martha heard the sound of glass breaking. A burglar, she gasped. I better call the police. She carefully dialed 911. But when she opened her mouth to speak, Arf, yes, woof, woof, arf, arf, woof. Martha hadn't eaten a bowl of alphabet soup in days. Martha raced to the kitchen. She barked, she growled, she tried to look ferocious. She goes, Grr. The burglar wasn't frightened. He picked up a pot from the stove. Uh-oh, thought Martha. It's tabs for sure. But to her surprise, the burglar put the pot down on the floor in front of her. Here, doggy, he said, have something nice to eat. The burglar smiled as he closed Martha into the kitchen and went back to work. At least he didn't hit her, huh? That would be sad. Dumb dog, he said. Lucky for me, you like alphabet soup. When Martha's family returned, they found the police removing the burglar from their house. How did you know he was robbing our house? asked Helen. We got a call at the station, said the officer. Some lady named Martha. Good dog, Martha, exclaimed her happy family. You are so right, said Martha. Now Martha eats bowls of alphabet soup every day. She's learning what to say and when to say it. And sometimes she doesn't say anything at all, at least for a few minutes. The end. Okay, well, that was good, huh? And Rita got to hear a nice story with the rest of her family. Good girl. Okay, the next thing we're going to do are some training. With these guys will do some jumps and some tricks. And then we'll get another one of their family to read our next piece here. All right, Rita, I'm going to take you back to your bed now. There's a good girl. We'll be right back. So this is Fozzie dancing. Oh, he dance. He dance. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Let's dance. Let's dance. Oh, yeah, there we go. Good job. So of course, Fozzy loves to dance. Dancing is super fun. Good job. Come on, dance. Good job. So for this part, I'm going to put them off leash and offer some treats. We are in our backyard and this is a demonstration. So of course, we've got Fozzie dancing. He also can do his paws up and we can dance together, partner dance. Huh? 
And if I clap my hands, they'll jump into my arms. Good job. And get ready for a dance. Good boy. Let's try it again. Okay. Let's try it again. You ready? Good job. Good job. Stay. Good boy. All right. Excellent. Okay. I'm going to have you sit over here. Okay, stay down. Good, you stay. Baxi likes to dance too. Now he does a lot of spins and he does a little bit of partner dance. But he loves doing a lot of jumps and stuff. Baxi, thanks. Good job. You jump, you jump, good. Okay, let's do it again. Come on, Dax. Over here, jump. Good, jump. Good. Let's do it higher, okay? Let's see. You jump. Good. And jump. <laughs> that was messy here. Try that again. Jump. And jump. Good job. Yay. Come on, Dax. Come on. Good. Let's try that again. Over on this side. Good job. Do it again. Good job. You ready? That was messy. Let's try that again. Good job. Under. Good. And over. Good job. All right. Good job, boys. Maxie, can you also bow? Good job. Maxie, jump. Good job. Good job. And Maxi, pause up. Stay. Good boy. Good. For our next book, I'm going to go ahead and grab Doxy's brother, his litter mate. His name is Tiger Arrows. And uh, <laughs> he will be joining us for our next book. So I'd like to introduce you to Tiger Arrows. This is Doxy's brother and litter mate. Can you show the people your cute little face? Oh, what a cute face, what a cute face. All right. So he recently got groomed, so he is very fuzzy right now, just like Doxy. They both got groomed on the same day, huh? We did that on camera, didn't we? And we're going to be reading to Tiger, Benjamin's Best Bully Buddy, by our friend Karen McDaniel. And dedication. This book is for all the wonderful yet misunderstood bully breeds and for all the equally wonderful people who love them. We have some good bully friends too, huh? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, I went to visit my best buddy Romeo. Mommy said we were going bye bye, but it's so hard to wait. Mommy takes a long time to get ready, but I was a real good boy. I sat nicely and stared at Mommy. It helps her go faster, and I was only a little wiggly. Finally, Mommy got my leash and clipped it to my collar, and I jumped for joy. We were going bye-bye to see my best buddy. Mommy opened the car door, and I jumped on my seat. Wow, a car ride, too? Best day ever. I knew when we were close. I could hear all the dogs talking to each other. They knew we were coming. Soon, Mommy stopped the car. She helped me jump down, and away we went into the shelter to visit Romeo. I ran up and down the hall looking for Romeo. I finally found him laying by the front people door. 
I sniffed him and wiggled, but he didn't want to play. I found a toy and tried to play tug the toy, but Romeo just wouldn't play. Oh, poor Romeo. Romeo, it's me, Benjamin, I said while shaking the toy. I know, said Romeo sadly. I stopped playing and asked, what's wrong, buddy? Romeo turned his head toward me and said, I'm kind of sad today. I was real confused because today was a wonderful day, so I asked why. I wanted to play with him so he would feel happy again. Romeo's voice got real quiet and he said, some people saw me at the dog park today and they were afraid of me. I was still pretty confused, so I asked again, why? Romeo sighed and said sadly, they saw me and a lady started yelling real loud, that's a bully, I don't like them, they're all mean and they bite. Oh, I said, now I was confused and sad for my friend. My mommy tried to talk to her, but the lady just kept yelling at me and told me to get away, Romeo said. Finally, we left, and I felt sad. But you're not mean, you're nice, and the only thing you bite are hamburgers, I said with a laugh. I thought it was pretty funny and that that would cheer up my buddy, but it didn't. I don't understand how people can think you are mean. You're one of the nicest dogs I know. Can't they see that? That's the problem, Benjamin. They only see what I look like, said Romeo sadly. My big head and stocky body. They don't know me at all. Some people think all dogs that look like me are bad dogs. Oh no, not bad dog, but why? Did you chew up their shoe, I asked? Did you pee on their towel or maybe eat their hamburger when they weren't looking? I remembered I did that once and I was bad dog for a little while. No, no, it's because I'm a pity, a pit bull, a bully breed, Romeo answered very patiently. I still don't see, I started to say, but Romeo started to. That's because you don't see anything, you're blind. This is actually the third book in the series, so he's a little blind dog, but he's a very sweet boy. Yeah, so what difference does that make, I asked, shaking my head, because it was starting to hurt from being so confused. Benjamin, you can't judge me by how I look. You know the real me, Romeo said as he laid his big head on his paws. I lay down next to my best buddy and thought all about what he had told me. I thought for a long time. Suddenly, I had a wonderful idea, so I jumped up and said, I know how to make everyone love you as much as I do. Romeo opened one eye and said, really? That would be great, how? Well, I started, everyone would know how wonderful you are if they were all blind like me. You are my best buddy, my best bully buddy. Romeo puffed, but I'm pretty sure he smiled too. Bye-bye. And then it says about the author. Karen McDaniel, author and illustrator, is also a media arts and business teacher. She volunteers her time and talent to animal rescue in the Central Valley of California. She works with Animal Compassion Team Act of California as a foster home and has lent her talents as an illustrator to paint the halls of the Act Sophia Adoption Center with fun and happy scenes. Living in the beautiful San Joaquin Valley in California, she is concerned with the overpopulation of unwanted dogs and cats that flood the local shelters. She's a strong advocate of spaying and neutering pets as a solution to this issue. For more information about her work, can be found at www.creativecaring.com. And she's one of our fans. And this is what the real Benjamin looks like. <laughs> 
All right, well, good job, boys. Three boys right now, huh? So we'll go ahead and put Tiger back in his house, and uh, we'll be right back for our very last story. Say bye bye to brother. Say bye bye. All right, so now that our family is back in their homes, uh, we'll go ahead and read our very last story, which will be for our older readers. Time Cat by Lloyd Alexander that we've been reading for a while. All right, so we are on chapter nine of Time Cat called Secret Journeys. So we will explore the continuing story of Jason and his time traveling cat, Gareth, the black cat with a white mark on his chest. And uh, we are currently in Japan and they are going out on the streets with uh, some kittens that the Emperor of Japan. In Kyoto, Gareth avoided the crowded streets, the tea houses where gaily colored lanterns glowed, the cook shops, the busy inns. Without seeming to think about which direction to take, the black cat found his way easily to the quieter sections and humbler quarters of the city. Through the narrow alleyways, the kittens never lagged behind. Five pairs of eyes as bright as tiny lanterns followed Gareth at every turn. Every so often, Gareth would stop and allow the kittens time to investigate the neighborhood. Whiskers alert, the little ones sniffed the air, dipped their paws into puddles of water, climbed to the tops of bamboo railings, pounced at shadows. They balanced on the rims of rain barrels, then jumped like divers back to the ground. The kittens won't find any of this in the palace, Gareth said. Oh, they'll learn a lot there, too but a cat likes to know what's on both sides of a wall. I hope Ichigo doesn't mind, Jason said, or Uncle Fujiwara, that would be worse. We'll worry about that later, Gareth said. A cat can always think of something when the time comes. Right now, I'd like to have a look in some of those houses. Since all of the houses in the quarter were made of paper screens and rather flimsy ones, Gareth had no trouble finding a way in. The first house they visited belonged to a carpenter. The workshop, filled with tools and planks of wood, stacks of bamboo and unfinished pieces of furniture, had the sharp, warm scent of wood shavings and sawdust. Gareth, his head raised quizzically, detected something else. Rats, he said. He crouched, his muscles tensed, his tail lashed back and forth. Plenty of them, probably as big as the kittens. They're wicked fighters. Even a grown cat has to watch and step with them. Well, this is a good place as any for kittens to learn. Stay here, he warned Jason. We can move faster if nobody's in the way. Gareth, with the kittens trotting silently behind, moved through the workshop and disappeared into the shadows. Jason tiptoed outside and sat, well out of sight, around the corner from the carpenter's house. What a difference, he thought, between the palace and this part of the city. Here the houses were so jammed together that the whole neighborhood could easily fit into Ichigo's throne room. No sound came from the workshop. After half an hour, the anxious Jason decided he had better go find the hunters. But Gareth and the kittens popped out at just that moment. That carpenter's going to be grateful in the morning, said Gareth as he led the procession back to the palace. He couldn't catch all the rats, but the ones that got away had such a scare that I don't think they'll be back for a while. The kittens did very well. Ichigo should be proud of them. There was an expedition every night for the rest of the week. Jason always went along to help with Gareth. There was an expedition every night for the rest of the week. Jason always went along to help Gareth keep an eye on the kittens. Not that they really needed it. In the course of the week, Jason saw that they had not only grown bigger in size, but their walk was more confident and they carried their tails more jauntily. The kitten still had a lot to learn. During one expedition, a kitten accidentally knocked over some cooking pots. They made such a clatter that the owner of the house woke up. Top not bobbing, a broom twigs in his hand and man dashed into the room and began shouting fearfully. Jason, Gareth, and the kittens took to their heels and didn't stop until they reached the palace again. In the throne room the next day, Uncle Fujiwara paced back and forth, scowling more than usual. There are strange things happening in Kyoto, the regent said. Only this morning, a carver of jade reports that his house was invaded by a hundred spirits. 
He valiantly seized a broom to fight them off, but they disappeared through a hole in the wall. Jason smiled to himself. Wherever Gareth had taken him, it seemed that people enjoyed exaggerating. How the jade carver could make a hundred spirits out of five kittens, Jason could not imagine. But Uncle Fujiwara, and Ichigo too, never thought of doubting the story. And there is more, the regent went on. In certain quarters, rats have been disappearing from the houses. But that's good, isn't it? Jason asked. Speak when you're spoken to, Master of Imperial Cats, the regent said angrily. He continued, mysterious forces are at work. Seventy-two scholars are now studying this problem. So far, they will only say that none of this took place until the arrival of these foreigners. The regent gestured contemptuously at Jason and Gareth. But I like these foreigners, Ichigo put in. You too speak when you are spoken to, snapped Uncle Fujiwara. This is a warning. If this boy and his strange animal have anything to do with this, they will suffer the consequences. I don't understand, said Jason when he and Gareth were alone in their chamber. You'd think Fujiwara would be glad rats were disappearing. That's another thing about emperors and regents, Gareth said. They aren't very fond of changes even if the changes are for the better. Do you think we should take the kittens out again? We can't interrupt their education just because Uncle Fujiwara is in a bad temper, Gareth said. Don't worry about it. There won't be any trouble. That night, however, Gareth was wrong. They had stayed out later than usual, and dawn had begun to break. At one street corner, Jason saw a company of Imperial guards. Just slide along this wall, Gareth whispered. Very quietly, they'll never notice us. It would have worked, except for one kitten who lagged behind and, afraid of being separated from the others, began mewing so loudly that the honorable imperial captain turned around. Next moment, Jason, Gareth, and the kittens were surrounded. Recognizing the imperial crest on the kimonos, the honorable imperial captain marched everyone back to the palace. In the throne room, as soon as Ichigo saw them, he leapt to his feet. How dare you steal the imperial kittens, he cried. Jason tried to explain what he and Gareth had been doing. Ichigo paid no attention. He fondled the kittens, examined each one for damages, brushed specks of dust from the kimonos. You are no longer my friend, said Ichigo, almost in tears. I shall call Uncle Fujiwara and let him decide what to do with you. Why don't you make up your own mind for a change, Jason said. If you think I should have my head chopped off, you don't need to ask your uncle. Only do one thing. Bring in one of the people we visited. Bring in the carpenter or anybody and talk to them first. You think the words of a carpenter can make any difference? Asked Ichigo. I think they'll make a lot of difference, Jason said. Ichigo finally agreed. Jason described the quarter they had visited the first night. The honorable imperial captain of the guards recognized it and sent two men to fetch the carpenter. While they waited, Ichigo sat glumly. The kittens played in front of him but the emperor was too preoccupied to notice. Finally, the carpenter was brought in, trembling with fear, convinced that his head would be chopped off at any moment. Do you have rats in your house? Jason asked. No, no, the carpenter answered. Only a week ago, this humble and insignificant person was plagued with honorable rats. Now, suddenly, the rats are gone. It is a great miracle. Every day, this wretched one gives thanks to the spirits of his ancestors. Here are the ones you should thank. Jason pointed to the kittens. The carpenter dropped to his knees and bumped his head six or eight times against the floor. Are these the kindly spirits who protected my unworthy home? Blessings, blessings. These are cats, Jason said. Whatever they may be, said the carpenter, they have great powers. My wife blesses them. The food for my children is no longer stolen. The carpenter bowed so much and knocked his head so gratefully that the guards had to carry him out of the throne room and let him recover in the hall. He did seem pleased, Ichigo said. I know you're an emperor and a celestial presence and all that, Jason said. But if you were anybody else, I'd say you were being selfish. There's no reason why the kitten shouldn't help your people. They certainly aren't doing much good being locked up in the palace. Cats aren't toys just to be played with. I know what I'll do, Ichigo said. I'll have the artist come and paint more pictures. Then everybody in Japan shall have one. That won't do any good. But they are the most excellent and honorable artists, Ichigo protested. It doesn't matter, Jason said. A picture of a cat won't work. You have to have real ones. 
Ichigo thought for a moment, then he shook his head. I don't know what else to do. I shall ask Uncle Fujiwara. Can't you forget Uncle Fujiwara, Jason cried impatiently. It's time you stopped acting like a baby and started behaving like an emperor. Before Jason could finish, Uncle Fujiwara himself appeared in the throne room. What is that fainting carpenter doing out there, he shouted. He's babbling about miracles and spirits with long tails. So, the regent caught sight of Jason. I knew this foreigner had something to do with it. That is true, said Ichigo. This foreigner has taught me many things about cats and other matters. I have thought carefully, and this is my decision. These kittens are too valuable to remain uselessly in the palace. They shall come and go as they please. That is not all, Ichigo added. When the merchant Sun Chang visits... That is not all, Ichigo added. When the merchant Sun Chang visits us again, he shall be asked to bring more kittens, enough for every house in Japan. I've heard enough, Uncle Fujiwara said. You, my worthy nephew, have gone completely mad. It is the influence of this boy and his cat. I think it's necessary to dispose of him and his cat and these kittens. Uncle Fujiwara pulled out his sword and seized Jason by the hair. We will start with this one. He threw Jason to the floor and stood over him, sword upraised. Stop, I command you. Jason had never heard Ichigo use that tone of voice before. Uncle Fujiwara was so surprised that his arm froze motionless in the air. This is my master of imperial cats, Ichigo said. He is under my protection. I order you not to harm him. Uncle Fujiwara slowly turned and looked curiously at Ichigo. What did you say? He asked in a cold voice. I order you, Ichigo repeated. The regent drew closer to the throne. Worthy nephew, he said through clenched teeth. As your advisor and instructor, I caution you on your use of words. If there is any ordering to be done here, if there is any ordering to be done, Ichigo cried, then I shall do it. I am emperor, not you. Why, you ridiculous, insignificant little Uncle Fujiwara raised his sword again. You threaten me, Ichigo said. You dare to threaten your emperor? I could have you boiled in oil, humble yourself in the celestial presence. Ichigo's eyes blazed. For a moment, Jason feared that Uncle Fujiwara would run the boy through the glances of the region and emperor locked. Your emperor commands you. Jason had never seen such a look of fury as the one that darkened the regent's face, but Fujiwara was the first to turn his eyes away. He dropped his weapon to the floor and bowed deeply. Jason and Gareth walked silently from the room. Near the throne, the kittens played happily with the tassels of Fujiwara's sword. It was pretty good. So our next one is going to be in Italy in 1468 AD. We will see what else happens to Jason and Gareth. The very last thing that we're going to do is answer some questions from our friends and our fam. What do you say, Dax? Is he ready to do that? Looks like he is. <laughs> Fuzzy Bear, you ready? <coughs> Good job. Okay, do we have any questions today from our audience? So the question is, do they realize when it's time for a visit? The answer is most definitely yes. Dogs, they can't see uh, different colors. Um, red to them appears gray, for instance. But they know that when mommy puts on her special gray shirt, or when I get out their special gray bandanas, like this one here, that it is time for a visit. And they get so excited, they start spinning around in circles. Can you show me how you get? Can you show me how you get? Oh yeah, he gets so excited. And they really are happy and wanting to go and visit. And sometimes, like they know the times of the week. So we usually visit on Saturdays, especially Fozzie. He'll follow me around the house on Saturdays and uh, see what we're going to do. So lately, of course, we haven't been able to do our usual visits on Saturdays. But they still really look forward to these sessions, too. Huh. And when they see me getting ready for our videos, they know it's time for some fun, they get some pets, they get to read, and they get to do some other fun stuff too. So they like it. It's a good thing. Huh. Yeah, it's good. It's good. 
Any other questions? <laughs> Fuzzy, do you have any questions for our audience? Fuzzy Bear. <laughs> He wants to know what everybody's favorite book has been so far. So maybe you could, uh, for our YouTube audience, maybe you could uh, send us an email. We have our email on there. Or get on our Facebook. Both the boys have Facebook. And uh, you can maybe write in what your favorite story has been from our session. Any other questions for us? No? Okay. I think we're good. Can you guys show them we love them? Good. Good. All right. Fuzzy, can you say hi? Good job. Bye, guys. <laughs>